my own personal journey here was that I, I set about trying to find out, well, what do we know about workplace culture? How does poor leadership impact employees? Well, I think what we've really discovered in the, the course of the last 18 months is that the way that we used to run management is probably no longer fit for purpose. And what I mean by that is there used to be a principle of management and a principle of leadership was that if you were good at a job, you got elevated to manage that job. And I think what we've recognised now is that managing and leading is a, is a far more complex skill than it's ever been before. Let me give you a specific example. One of the things that we find anytime someone is a leader is they often, like all of us, they want more control over their team. And I think what we've learned right now is that the thing that really differentiates good performance in the era of remote work or hybrid work is giving our teams a a degree of control themselves, giving them a degree of autonomy. And that means that the the managers who want to see where their workers are or want to check who they're if they're online all the time, they can definitely do it. But they're the people who are experiencing more burnout in their employees. So it's a a real pivotal moment. I mean, that phrase, I think, is probably uh, very easy to use. But we are very much at a pivotal moment when it it comes to the way that work is configured, because I think right before our very eyes, the the expectations and requirements of work are changing. I think even I spend all day every day thinking about how work is evolving and changing. And I think if you asked me three months ago, six months ago, I would give you a different perspective of what work would look like a year down the road. And I think that's not necessarily that I was wrong before, but I think we're watching this transform before our very eyes. So big demands on leadership, big demands on management. I think it's, it really sort of shows to us that we've got a complicated job to do. And uh, the, the big differentiator is going to be firms who have the very, very best leaders. And what are the top contributing factors that design a business's culture? Yeah, I, I talk a lot about this. And, you know, I, I personally feel that there are some critical pillars i i found myself working in tech firms or found myself working in in you know two two huge silicon valley companies and my first instinct when i went work for those firms was that they would have all the answers when it came to culture and and what i discovered very quickly is they've got no more of the answers than any other firm we might look at but what you do discover and, and my own personal journey here was that i i set about trying to find out well, what do we know about workplace culture? What, we, what do we know about uh, high performance uh, cultures? And you, you find that there's a, a number of key ingredients. You find uh, there's something called psychological safety that exists in some of the best organizations. Uh, you find that some of the best organizations become very focused on really sort of um, redressing the balance between communication and autonomy. Um, you know, I, I saw something wonderful, which was having given the caveat that tech firms don't always have the answers that we uh, we are looking for. Amazon used to do something which was uh, Jeff Bezos believed that communication was the enemy of innovation. And what do I mean by that? He said that effectively, the more time that you ask your team to keep everyone else updated on things and to keep other people in the loop. Effectively, it crowds out innovation because it takes so much of our time. So Jeff Bezos, in the first iteration of Amazon, his objective was to try and eliminate communication between his team. Well, that's a remarkable thing because I suspect a lot of us, when we're performing the appraisals on our employees or when we're thinking about who's done a good job or not, what we often do is we say, how good are they at communication? And the idea that communication might exist in opposition to, to good culture would be something that is probably difficult for us to take on board. But I think it's an illustration that culture doesn't necessarily live in the obvious places. And so considering what's happened over the last couple of years, Do you believe businesses will continue working from home? And if so, how can they ensure employee engagement in the long term? Yeah, it's a really critical thing. Someone said to me a few months ago, is there any way to build community through a screen? And my answer uh, was the same now as it, it was then. My answer was, I'd love to introduce you to the Internet. 
uh, uh, because there's been no shortage of communities, passionate communities built by people through screens. However, we don't have to stick to that. We don't have to stick to just people dialing into Zooms. We can we can be far more, uh, I think, nuanced, far more structured in it. But there is a fundamental truth. And the fundamental truth is that workers feel that they've demonstrated that remote working has a role to play. And increasingly, we're seeing that as a consequence of that, employees aren't willing to go back to the office five days a week. So then you find yourself in a situation, if employees aren't willing to go back five days a week and want to do some remote working, and that we know the result of that is that the office won't feel the same. You have one or two things. You can exist in denial. You can pretend, okay, well, we're going to try and make it like it was before. Uh, or you can say, okay, but how about let's start with the end in mind and let's say we want to create a culture that is ener energized, that has a strong sense of identity that runs through it, that has a, a differentiated sense of, of motivation. What can we do? And I think a lot of people who maybe are in this discussion find themselves longing for the past, thinking, well, it was better in my day. I, I tend to see those people a bit like that that chap that we always see on the TV news once a year, who um, has decided that he loves Christmas so much that he's going to play Mariah when he wakes up in the morning and he puts his Christmas jumper on and he has a little tot of brandy around lunchtime and he has he sits down for his Christmas lunch around three o'clock after watching a repeat of the Queen's. No matter how much that dude pretends it's Christmas, today isn't Christmas. And no matter how much we might want work to go back to what work once was, or maybe a sort of a, a nostalgic version of what work wants for us, we're not going back to it. So it's far better for us to say, what can we do to, to take the new sets of criteria and create something really special and energised with that, rather than saying, OK, well, you know, should we just moan about how it was better in my day? And I think that's the big differentiator right now. The big differentiator is firms saying, you know what, we can create an amazing buzz here, but we're going to do it in a different way. Rather than saying, we want you back in the office every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, uh, because you're going, to, you're going to rediscover some of that magic work culture that we've told you so much about. So I think, you know, it's a real time for leaders. The interesting thing is, as leaders, uh, leaders have probably spent the, the last, uh, the, the entirety of their Career, telling their teams they needed to embrace change you know leaders are always the advocates of change when there's another restructure coming or a new reorg managers are always like we need to get the team to embrace change now change is all around us and it would be a tragedy if it's the leaders who aren't willing to embrace it